to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Later he said, baptism does now also save us. Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Often when we are, hear these passages and people see what they say, they begin to make objections. I understand that's what it says, but here's why it doesn't mean that, or here's why that means something different, or I don't believe baptism is important because of this. Today, we hope that you've got your Bible handy. Today, we're going to try to address some of the objections to baptism and answer those from Scripture. Oftentimes, denominational people will say that baptism is not essential to salvation when the Bible clearly teaches it is. And they begin to offer reasons. Do those reasons have merit? What does the scripture say? We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. Uh, we hope you'll get your Bible out and have it ready as we're going to let the word of God answer these matters. And friend, we want you to know today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the churches of Christ, the Lord's church in your area. We'd love for you to stop by and visit them. You'll find friendly people there who just simply want to go by the Bible, worship God in spirit and truth, and have a thus saith the Lord for everything they say and do. And so check out the Lord's Church in your area. Visit them on Sunday or Wednesday for their worship or Bible study times. They would be glad to have you. And friend, if you'd like to study more on this matter, Please stop by and visit those folks in your area at the church or contact us. We'd be glad to help you. And won't you check out our website as well, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material, over 500 lessons, both on the Old and New Testament, and a wide variety of topical studies as well. Every book of the Bible is addressed. We hope that you'll check out our website if you'd like to have a copy of this series on baptism or any of our series. We'll make those available to you free of charge. If you need a DVD for watching or a CD for listening to, or you would like to have a digital download for your computer or device, we can make that available to you as well. And don't forget about the Gospel of Christ app. Check us out on Facebook as well. A lot of good things going there with the digital media and things of that nature. And so please check all that out and keep up with what we're doing there as well. What about these objections that we often hear concerning baptism? There are too many clear passages, as we noted in our last two lessons. Too many clear passages which clearly teach that baptism is something that is essential to salvation for the forgiveness of sins. It's how we get in Christ. And Peter said it does save us. It's where we contact the saving blood of Jesus, Romans 6, 1 through 4. But often when people hear those verses, because that sometimes doesn't align with what they've been taught or what they think or some prejudice they might hold, they begin to offer objections to that. And so today we want to address some of those from the Word of God. And, and please understand, our only motive in addressing these objections is for the truth to come forth. We love people. We want them to be saved. We want to say the things we say in love because more than anything, we want people to be saved, to know the truth, and to go to heaven. What's the first objection? I hear quite often when people talk about baptism or presented with certain scriptures, they'll say, well, that's all good, but baptism is a work and the Bible says no works. My friend, I understand that the Jews were trying to merit their way to heaven. But what we've got to realize is in the Bible, there are two different types of works. There are, con there are works of merit, which the Jews said to Jesus, 
in John chapter 6 through 8. We're the children of Abraham. We have the right to the promises. Uh, we can do these things because we have merited this. We deserve it. We met these merits. And Jesus said, don't say that to yourself. God's able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. And so they had circumcision. They had the bloodline, all of that. And so they thought they had merited their salvation. And that type of meritorious work where I've earned it is definitely condemned. My friend, that doesn't say then that conditional works, things we must do, are therefore bad. Let me illustrate. To the person who says, baptism cannot be essential to salvation because baptism is a work and you can't do any works. Friend, did you realize when you say that, you condemn yourself when you believe in Jesus? You can't even believe in Jesus if you believe no works. And what do you mean by that? Open your Bible to John chapter 6. I want you to see that belief is also a work. It's not a meritorious work. It is a conditional work from God for man. Look in John chapter 6, and I want you to see what the Bible says in verses 28 and 29. Then they said to Jesus, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, Listen now, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. And so the person who says no works, hey, you can't even believe in Jesus. If you hold that ideology, if you hold to that belief fast and say, baptism cannot save because baptism is a work and no works, don't even believe in Jesus then. Because Jesus said, this is the work. They want to know, what do we need to do to work the work of God? Jesus said, here it is. This is a work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. And so if I say that, I'm caught in a logical contradiction because I can't even believe in Jesus. And everyone recognizes belief in Jesus is essential to salvation. And so in the Bible, works of merit are definitely condemned. I cannot earn it. I cannot say enough good things. I cannot do enough. It is a Luke 17, verse 10. And you, when you've done all those things commanded you, say, I'm, I'm an unprofitable servant. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. I can't merit it. Friend, that doesn't negate the thing. The idea that there are conditions that I must meet and do to be saved. A second objection that we often hear. A lot of times I hear people say, Baptism cannot be essential to salvation because the Bible says a person is justified by faith only. Now, here's the problem. Don't misunderstand. Does the Bible teach to be saved a person must believe in Christ? Well, sure. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm he, you'll surely die in your sins. The problem is that little word only. The Bible never teaches a person is justified by faith only or faith alone. In fact, did you know the Bible teaches the exact opposite of that? Did you know the Bible teaches you cannot be saved by, saved by faith alone? That's right. The only time the words faith and alone or faith only occur in my Bible and yours, God says the exact opposite of what millions have been taught. Look in your Bible for yourself in James chapter 2 with me. Open your Bible to James chapter 2. And I want you to notice what the scripture says in verse number 24. James says, You see then that a man is justified by works, and watch this, and not by faith only. Only occurrence of faith only or faith alone in the Bible. And God says you're not justified by faith alone. Again, faith's essential. Believing in God's essential, but God says it's not. You are not justified means just as if I'd never sinned. You are not justified by faith alone. And that goes right along with what Jesus said. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. Not everybody who Names the name of Jesus, has faith only, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so, friend, please hear me well today. There are a lot of people who go around and teach 
All you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. Faith and faith alone saves. And yet the only time you see those words in the Bible, remember James 2.24, God says the exact opposite of that idea. A third objection of baptism, and this is the one that I probably hear as, as much as any. Baptism cannot be essential to salvation because the thief on the cross was saved without baptism. Now, I want you to follow, I want to show you first of all that this line of thinking is not sound or correct reasoning. And here's why. The argument broken down would go like this. The thief was never baptized, statement number one. The thief was saved, statement number two. Conclusion, therefore, a person can be saved without being baptized. Now, for that to be a sound argument, every one of those premises would need to be true. The problem is the first premise is unprovable and is an assertion only. The statement, the thief was never baptized. You can't prove that anywhere in the Bible. That is not taught. That is not said. That is not found anywhere in the Bible. In fact, you'd come a lot closer to proving he was. John chapter 3 says, All Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions round about went out and were baptized by him. How do you know the thief wasn't one of those? Well, I don't know he was, but I don't know he wasn't. How do you know? If you're going to base your salvation on this, how can you know? I'm not talking about think or maybe or wonder. How can you know the thief was never baptized? You can't. That's an assumption. That is a, a man-made idea that is not found in the Bible. And are you going to base your salvation on something you can't prove? And friend, on top of that, not only is that not a sound argument because you cannot prove the very first premise of it, and therefore the conclusion is not valid as well. But friend, here's what you've got to realize. When we think about the thief on the cross, what covenant did the thief live and die under? Well, we realize that the covenant of Jesus, Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 17 says, a covenant is in force after men are dead. The thief lived on the cross and died on the cross before the new covenant went into effect. He's an example of someone under the Old Testament. He is not an example of New Testament salvation for us today. And just as well, Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins, Mark chapter 2, verse 10. But today we know, we know that Jesus' law has been given and he's told us what to do. And so the argument. The thief was never baptized. The thief was saved. Therefore, I can be saved without being baptized. Friend, that's just unprovable. That is not a sound argument because you cannot prove the thief was never baptized. You can't prove it either way. Why would you want to put your salvation on something that you cannot prove like unto that? Number four, I hear people say today, well, Jesus forgave people's sins any way he wanted to, uh, under the Old Covenant or in the New Testament, and he can do that today. There's no doubt Jesus has the power on earth to forgive sins. Mark chapter 2, verse 10, But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. There's no doubt Jesus had that power to heal, to do, to forgive, as he chose to do so while he was here. My friend, the matter of today is this. Jesus has left this earth. And he's given us his will. He's told every person through his word what they must do to be saved. And I'm not going to be judged by what I think or what I feel or what Jesus might have said to someone while he walked on this earth necessarily speaking directly to that person. I'm going to be judged by what I've got to do according to the Bible to be saved. John 12 verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Friend, as we think about this idea, Jesus can just forgive people's sins however he wants. Well, friend, Jesus has said, we're going to be judged by his words. The new covenant of Jesus Christ teaches us exactly what we must do to be saved. And when we talk about the words of Jesus judging us, 
Let's remember it's Jesus who said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. All right, let's talk then about a fifth objection that I hear. Sometimes people will say when presented with very clear passages like Mark 16, 16, they'll say, well, although baptism is mentioned there, it's not mentioned as a condition for condemnation. Let me show you in the Bible. Look in Mark chapter 16, and I'll show you what we're talking about. Mark chapter 16 and verse number 16. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And so since baptism is not mentioned in the latter part of that verse, Jesus didn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized will be condemned, then baptism is not essential to salvation. Friend, you have to completely and absolutely disregard the first part of that verse to get that. Jesus clearly and explicitly said, he that believes and is baptized We'll be saved. A friend, not only that, it would have been utterly ridiculous for Jesus to say, even though you don't believe, if you're not baptized, you're going to be dimmed. Well, if you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized anyway, right? Why would Jesus say, he who believes, and oh yeah, even though you don't believe, you're not baptized, you'll be condemned. If you don't believe, you're not going to be baptized anyway. If you truly have faith, active faith, as is seen in the Bible of the people who please God, you're going to do what God says anyway. And so instead of disregarding based on what Jesus didn't say, let's obey based on what Jesus did say. Listen to it again. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, that is one of those so plain, so clear, and so explicit statements that you need help to misunderstand that. If you believe and if you're baptized, you will be saved. If you don't even believe, you're not a candidate to be baptized. You're going to be condemned anyway. All right, a sixth objection. Oftentimes when we talk to people about Bible verses that present the truth on baptism, they come up with some words that don't really mean what they're supposed to mean. For example, look in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 with me. Oftentimes I will hear people say, yes, Acts 2, 38 seems to indicate that baptism is for the remission of sins, but for really doesn't mean for there. Look in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so some have come up with the idea that for here means because of. Now, if you study the word for in the New Testament, about 99.5% of the time, it means in order to or for to receive something is the idea. And so, number one, it, it doesn't go again. It goes against the majority of times it's used over and above what we find in the New Testament. Secondly, to say that for means because of here, you have to completely butcher and go against the context of Acts 2. Listen carefully. Peter has preached to the Jews that they've just killed the Messiah. The Bible says in Acts 2, verse 37, they get that point. They are cut to the heart, and they cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They want to know, Peter and the rest of you men here, we get what you're saying. We're caught up in sin. How do we deal with that problem? And listen to what Peter said, if it's, if, if it's because of. Repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven. Well, if they were, it's something they didn't know. That's completely against the idea and the context of what's being taught there. We realize we're in sin. We realize we still need to be saved. Tell us what to do to do that. And Peter did tell them what to do, not what to do because they'd already been saved. That just doesn't make sense according to the context. But thirdly, and probably the clearest way to understand what the word for, the phrase for the remission of sins, what that means there is to find a parallel account where that phraseology is used. And by that, I mean this. If we can find a sentence 
with the same Greek structure for the remission of sins, and we can understand what it means there, surely we can understand what it means in Acts 2.38. Let's do that. Would you open your Bible to Matthew chapter 26, verse 28? Let's show what the phrase, according to the Bible, means for the remission of sins. Matthew chapter 26, and I want you to look in verse number 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, listen to it now, for the remission of sins. Now, friend, what does the phrase, same Greek structure, very similar there in that idea and that saying, what does the phrase for the remission of sins mean in Matthew 26, 28? Is there any way or is there anybody who believes it means because of there? Is Jesus saying, this is my blood. This represents my blood of the new covenant, which I shed because your sins were already forgiven. Did Jesus go and die on the cross because people's sins were forgiven? Of course not. Jesus shed his blood in order that, so that, for the purpose of people's sins being remitted. Now, friend, listen carefully to what we're saying. If in Matthew 26, 28, the phrase, for the remission of sins means in order that your sins might be forgiven. That's what the blood of Jesus was shed for. That same parallel ideology has to apply to Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. There's no evidence to show that it would mean anything different than that in the language itself. The context demands they are looking for an answer of what to do to be saved. And when we find that phraseology used in the New Testament, we can clearly see that exact same phraseology helps us to understand it means so that one's sins might be forgiven. Now, friend, let's stop here and drive the point home. All that evidence mounts up to help us realize that those who teach baptism is not essential to salvation, baptism is something good to do after you've already been saved, they're not teaching correctly. They're not teaching what the Bible says. They're not teaching what Jesus says. They're not teaching what Peter says. They're not teaching what the New Testament teaches throughout. That, my friends, is false doctrine. And that will cause people to be lost from God forever. And so the objection that for means because of just won't hold water when we look at the evidence. A seventh objection that I often hear people say is, well, I, under, I hear what some of these passages are saying, and I understand, you know, there's a significance and importance, and yeah, people ought to be baptized, but Paul didn't preach baptism in any of his gospel presentations. When Paul went places and he talked about Jesus and he talked about the gospel and he presented the message of Jesus, in presenting the gospel, Paul did not present baptism. Friend, that's just not true. Open your Bible to Romans 6 and I want you to see in preaching the gospel, which the core of it is, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Paul clearly made a parallel to baptism, and he did preach that. Look in Romans 6, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verses 1 through 4. Paul says, what shall we say then? Romans 6, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here is a clear presentation of the gospel. You've got the death of Christ. And that death is compared to our dying to sin, repenting of sin, turning from it. You've got the, the burial of Jesus. And that burial in Paul's gospel presentation is where we are buried with him in water and we contact his death. And then that, that, that triumphant resurrection, we rise out of the watery grave of baptism and we walk, we live and walk 
in newness of life. And so friend, the, the gospel is the good news of Jesus. The good news of Jesus is his death, burial, and resurrection. And that death, burial, and resurrection parallels our death to sin, our burial with him in water, and our rising up to walk in newness of life. And so friend, I want you to consider today, as you maybe have heard, as maybe you've made these objections, do they really do they really handle good scrutiny of the scripture? Do they really hold water when we look at the evidence? Can a person really say, based on these arguments, that baptism is not essential to salvation? How many people do you think have heard the old, tired argument that won't hold water, I don't have to be baptized because the thief was never baptized and he was saved? Friend, we've shown you can't prove that, and he was living under a completely different covenant than we are anyway. And yet, how many people have based their soul salvation on that faulty, unsound type of argument that is just an assertion? And so here's what we're saying, my friend. Today, more than anything, we want people to go to heaven. What, what men think, what man's opinion is, what man's argumentation may be, that's not what matters. What does the Bible say? What did Jesus explicitly say a person has to do to be saved? And friend, if you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, you've never submitted to the teaching of Jesus on baptism, we'd love to help you with that. Contact the local church of Christ in your area. We'd be glad to study with you. Contact us here at the Gospel of Christ. We'd love to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And friend, we know that some of this might be controversial, but please understand, we love you. God loves you. We want you to go to heaven. We hope you'll join us next time as we study more about the Gospel of Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.